we began a ongoing crusade starting in Washington, D.C. and the Supreme Court steps the following month and now all over the country one year later to assist Americans who are either ignorant, misinformed, or being crushed by this uh, terrible fear pandemic and terrible propaganda campaign uh, at every level of our country, which is really crushing society. And it's really, uh, from my point of view as a child and adolescent psychiatrist, just ruining an entire generation of American children. Welcome to the 100 Year Lifestyle Podcast, dedicated to you and your loved ones living at 100% for 100 years and beyond. I'm your host, Dr. Eric Plasker. Welcome, everybody, to the 100 Year Lifestyle, where we are transforming health and longevity so that you and your loved ones can live at 100% for 100 years and beyond. And I have a very special guest, Dr. Mark McDonald. Uh, adolescent pediatric psychiatrist from California. Dr. Mark, welcome, my man. Thank you, Dr. Plasker. Really appreciate the opportunity to speak with you today. Well, uh, we met, Dr. McDonald and I, we met in Atlanta. Uh, he's one of America's frontline doctors, a bold, strong, important group of doctors, Simone Gold, Dr. Simone Gold, and some other great doctors bringing this group together to speak out about the truth. These are truly America's frontline doctors, not the political doctors that are working with people on the ground, in communities, in emergency rooms, in a clinical setting, in their offices, just like we are, many of our 100 Year Lifestyle chiropractors and other doctors in our network around the country and around the world. And I heard Dr. Uh, McDonald speak and he really touched me. Uh, we both love children, he cares for children. And so, um, Dr. Mark, uh, tell us a little bit about your background and why you started speaking up about this issue and these issues. Well, I treat children and adolescents primarily, although I also do see adults in my private practice in West LA. I have been for about 10 years now. And children have been for really since the advent of the smartphone, suffering from worsening anxiety and depression for a lot of reasons, which is a whole nother subject. But um, social media has really been the biggest single instigator of mental illness in younger people in the last decade. What surprised me, though, around March and April is that I noticed something different. The anxiety and depression didn't seem to be instigated from smartphones and Facebook and Twitter and Snapchat and all those apps anymore. It seemed to be instigated by something else. And it was pretty clear to me within a matter of weeks that the driver of this collapse of mental illness was the closure of schools and the mass uh, pandemic of fear that resulted. And given that it all came out of left field and it, it all came out without any sort of rationality uh, and, and not even really any purpose that I could see, at least at the beginning, it started to get me thinking, well, what is it that I can do? Uh, I can treat my patients after the fact, but I'd like to get ahead of this. And I'd like to find like-minded professionals, physicians that I trust who are respectable, who are not politicized, but who really care about their patients and who above all else value truth in medicine. And I found that with the America's Frontline Doctors Group led by Dr. Simone Gold, an ER physician. And I joined the group in uh, April or May, and we began a ongoing crusade starting in Washington, D.C. and the Supreme Court steps the following month, and now all over the country one year later to assist Americans who are either ignorant, misinformed, or being crushed by this uh, terrible fear pandemic and terrible propaganda campaign uh, at every level of our country, which is really crushing society. And it's really, uh, from my point of view as a child and adolescent psychiatrist, just ruining an entire generation of American children. Well, what you're saying, when you use the word crushing, normally in circumstance, I would say, oh, come on, you're exaggerating. But I don't think that's the case at all. I really feel the same way as you. I, I love kids. I love taking care of kids. So many of our doctors, uh, chiropractors with family practices, seeing kids coming in and, and I see them in the grocery stores and I see them in the other types of areas on the playgrounds and they're afraid of each other. They're afraid of their parents. They're afraid of the ground. They're afraid to touch other things. They're afraid of their teachers. They're afraid of their siblings. And it really is destroying a generation of kids. And 
you know, in, in our practice, we'll tell people all the time, let me see your face. If they're wearing a mask, let me, do you have teeth? And we joke around with them. And the level of fear is, is crazy. We wrote an article, a couple of articles about it. We wrote one called the epidemic of fear. Uh, we put another one out, fear is a weapon. Uh, we did another program called becoming a least vulnerable person, which we're putting out as an ebook. And the challenge and the thing that concerns me, which I think is so important with your specialty and what you do, because I agree with you completely, that the true public, and I'm quoting the article that I just recently read that has been put out where you authored, or at least contributed to, you say the true public health crisis is psychological in nature. Talk about that for us a little bit. Well, I've distilled my thinking on this pandemic into three stages. And the first stage is a pandemic of fear and the inculcation and maintenance of that fear. It is not a medical pandemic. Now, I, I don't get me wrong. Uh, there are a lot of people suffering in this country. Most of them, however, are physically suffering, not from a virus, but from the consequences of a government shutdown of all life as we know it and a delay in getting access to medical care for pre-existing conditions or acute conditions like, uh, say, drug abuse or motorcycle accidents or uh, cancer. We have already confirmed far more deaths and hospitalizations due to that than we have due to people who were otherwise healthy and then got sick and died due to the Chinese Wuhan flu. That is indisputable. So what exactly is it that we should be looking at if it's not medical? Well, it's psychological. It's fear. And the reason for this is complex. But in summary, the reason why fear has become a pandemic in this country is not by accident. It's by design. The only way for a statist government to control a population is through fear. And the more afraid people are, the more dependent they will be on government and the less able they will be to think for themselves. And that ultimately is why, in my view, we are in the state that we are in. And again, we are completely aligned with that thought process. And you, I'll tell you what was interesting. You just mentioned the pre-existing conditions and comorbidities, not getting help for those types of things. I just read a recent article uh, in the London Telegraph. This is an amazing statistic. The World Obesity Federation studied 100 countries and found that 2.2 million of the 2.5 million COVID deaths happened in nations where obesity is a major issue. And we learned in doing our research for this uh, free ebook that we're going to come out within the next two weeks on becoming a least vulnerable person that that the comorbidity factor is vital. The the uh, over people being overweight, people on polypharmacy, and and you say that by design. And I agree with you there. But some people say, "Well, man, you're a conspiracy theorist. Come on, by design." I know that it's not by, that it is by design. And the concern that I have is that now, when you have so many people in fear. You use the term, I'm going to quote you also again, you said a delusion, and I don't know if this is your quote or just the actual definition, that this fear has gotten to a point that it has become a delusion. Maybe it's because we've been exposed to trillions of dollars worth of advertising this delusion or this fear, but you say a delusion is a fixed false belief that is contrary to reality. When I read that, Dr. Mark, it changed my perception of this because this is a true psychiatric condition now, not just for adults, but we are training children to think this way. Absolutely right. And you just entered, Dr. Klasker, into the second step of my three-step summary of what's happened to this country in the last 12 months, which is the development of a mass state of delusional psychosis. It starts with fear. You have to have that in the soil for the delusional psychosis to grow. Otherwise, it desiccates. But what moves beyond fear, what, what takes it to a higher level, is this inculcation of a fixed belief that is contrary to reality. It's not an opinion. It's not a hysterical state. It's not an exaggeration of emotion. It's actually believing that something exist when it doesn't. That doesn't generally happen on a mass level, at least not in a to a large degree for a long period of time. 
Uh, it's akin to a cult in a sense. Our whole country has basically joined a cult. I know I've said for a long time now, over a year, that when I started my residency, I was sent into locked psychiatric wards to treat patients who were crazy. And when I walked inside and let the door close behind me, I had to remind myself that every person I saw in that ward that didn't have a badge on was most likely crazy, insane, clinically ill. And that really helped me to think about how I would interact with those people and what types of conversations I would have and to not react as if it were a social conversation. Well, fast forward 15, 20 years, I'm now leaving my home in Los Angeles every day. And as the door closes behind me, I have to remind myself that any person I see walking around, biking, driving, pushing a baby carriage on the street, wearing a mask is likely to be insane likely to be suffering from delusional psychosis, likely to believe, if challenged, adamantly, firmly, defensively, defend and believe that if I or he fails to keep the mask on and get within six feet of one another, that we will murder each other, that we will place ourselves at risk of killing one another and perhaps killing everyone around us, that we are all walking plagues, whatever age, whatever sex, whatever health condition, regardless, we are putting each other at risk of imminent death by not hiding, running in fear, cowering, and wearing masks. That is not a mistake. That is not an error. That is not feeling afraid for a few days. That is insanity. That is clinically insane. And if someone came to my office a year ago and told me what I just said to you, I would say you have an illness, you need medication and therapy. And if it's really bad and you can't function, you might need to be in a residential treatment program. And I would not be out of line. And I don't think any of my colleagues would have criticized me for that. Well, you probably uh, back then, maybe you, I'm sure you had patients like that. Now you'd have millions and millions and hundreds of millions of these type of people. And, you know, it concerns me because when I, when I read that a delusion is a fixed false belief that is contrary, the opposite of what reality is, you, you say further down in your article, you say, delusional psychosis achieves nothing useful in reality. Now, that's important, and I want you to talk about that a little more because these are people that not only do they feel like they're being useful, they feel like they're saving humanity by wearing a mask, and they feel like people like me who don't wear a mask, and I don't wear a mask, and I went into, this was crazy, I went into Whole Foods the other day, and there was a guy there, I went to the to the uh, meat counter and I was going to place an order and there was a man there with a mask and he said, well, I can't serve you today because you're wearing a mask. And I said, that's not true. I said, I don't agree with that. That's not true. Can I talk to your manager? The manager came over and I got somebody else to serve me. And then he went to the back huffing and puffing as if he couldn't save the world because he couldn't get me to put a mask on. And so what do you say to people when they say, no, I am being useful. I'm saving the world. And this is not something that I'm making up. What do you say to those people? Or what do you say to people that are on the fence? Because that's the people that we're really talking to now, the people that are on the fence. Well, it's interesting. You know, you move into stage three, which might help to clarify or, or answer your question, which is group control. It's one thing for individuals to be afraid and to think that they're protecting themselves erroneously, it turns out, because before March of 2020, there wasn't a single publication anywhere in the world that found in a recognized scientific journal that wearing a mask over your face could protect you from any respiratory illness. Zero, I challenge anyone to find one. It doesn't exist. So it's just a false uh, belief. It's a, it's a lie, and then it becomes a false belief. But when you move beyond just being afraid and wanting to protect yourself, using this uh, talisman for anxiety, which is a face mask, which is really nothing more than a medieval superstition. It really isn't any more advanced than that. And you move into the, the third stage, which is as you experienced telling other people that they cannot interact with you unless they wear a face mask. Now you enter into another level of intrinsic insanity, not just from the outside looking in crazy, but crazy within crazy. Because the obvious observation for any person, a child even would make this observation. If you believe that this mask is so protective, why on earth does it matter to you if anybody else is wearing one? 
No one has ever answered that question in any reasonable way in the last year. And I've asked it to a lot of people with masks. They usually fall back on some lame kind of uh, rote uh, memory of hearing something along the lines of, well, it's it's a gesture of respect or it's virtuous or <laughs> my favorite is my mask protects you, your mask protects me. Almost like a mantra that you'd hear in a cult. Yeah. And I say, how does that make any sense? Are you saying it's a one-way mask? <laughs> and they don't have any answer to that. So I think that the fact that people not only are afraid and trying to protect themselves, but trying to enforce their beliefs on others through control, intimidation, and threat, physical threat often of violence, makes me believe that we're not in a, a, an emotional state purely. We're in an executive function disordered state in the same way that you are in a cult where if you're inside the cult and you don't want to perform the rituals or buy into the belief system, you're not just told that you're wrong. You're told that you need to be crushed. You need to have your job taken away, your possessions removed. You need to be cut off from society. You need to be re-educated like a re-education camp of the 20th century under communist Soviet Union or China, which is still going on today with the Uyghurs. Uh, it, it ultimately grows into a uh, a really sick totalitarian state that can only persist with uh, a large degree of um, mentally ill, compliant, and frightened people. Well, that's scary <laughs> to think yeah, that to is. think that the the numbers of people that are delusional or on the verge of being delusional uh, that they're astronomical numbers. And you mentioned something here about a communistic state, so to speak. And you say in your article, you say delusional people seek to control how others perceive reality and you have to conform to their fake reality or else. We are forcing children to conform to this fake reality so that their belief systems at the center of who they are as human beings is false. You and I grew up, I grew up where you eat the germs to kill the germs, you play in the dirt, you have chicken pox parties, you have an immune system, you take care of it, you do the things that you need to do to be healthy. And in this generation, none of that, it's all out the window. That doesn't exist because the underlying core belief that these children are learning about is, is that if you want to be a nice person, you have to wear a mask. If you're going to be a respectful person, you have to wear a mask. If you're going to be a healthy person, you have to wear a mask. And if your friends don't wear a mask, then you can't have them as a friend. I mean, the way I stop this insanity is I make them smile. I tell everybody to take their mask off and I, and I don't wear one and I don't comply. But on such a mass scale, how do we change what's happening here? How do we stop this? How do we get our compass back? Well, we've gone from a culture that idolized courage and fearlessness and individuation and taking care of oneself to a current climate and culture of compliance and dependency. You cannot have a compliant and dependent society, uh, at least initially, uh, without fear. It just isn't possible because people will not um, believe what they're being told, if it's false and a lie, if they have half a brain and modest amount of education, independent thought. That's been snuffed out now. As you said, we've elevated fear to a virtue and we've denigrated courage. You see signs all over the freeways and, and ads in California on the television, and even hear it on the radio, be a hero, stay at home. The idea that you are in charge of your life, of your health, of your own immune system is now not just um, ignored, it's derided. It's derided as selfish and mean and cruel and heartless and immoral. The idea that one can be a virtuous and healthy citizen by both complying with government demands and being dependent on the state and on big corporations and businesses is an immense inverse reversal or inversion, I guess is the word I'm thinking of, of what we as Americans have been uh, taught and uh, and instructed and, and educated on for the last two, 300 years. In my view, 
the only real way for us to uh, get through this problem is to encourage all Americans who are still afraid and understandably because many of them uh, don't know any other way at this point because of what they've been told 24 seven about death and, and, and destruction going on in their society is to not, not just encourage, but demand that all people in this country feel the fear, but act in spite of it and act through it. Because the only way to get rid of fear is to act against it. You can't get rid of an emotion by trying to think through it. You can't tell yourself, I'm not going to be afraid and then feel not afraid. The fear is there already. It's already there. It's not going anywhere, at least not in the short term. But we can act despite how we feel. This is a, a, an intrinsic uh, teaching uh, of, of psychology and psychiatry that uh, it has, it's sort of at the foundation of treatment, that your feelings are not what control you. You are in control of your actions despite how you feel. Now, if you're insane, if you're under delusional psychosis, there's, a, there's a, a, another problem and you may need medication, you may need a rehab program. But if you're simply afraid, then you need to act in spite of your fear and you need to act rationally. I don't see any way for us to get out of this until people accept that they don't have to act because of the way that they feel. We never did this before. We never told children when they were growing up, well, if you don't feel like going to school, you don't have to go to school. If you feel scared when you leave mommy, you just stay home. No, that was considered child abuse. That was bad parenting. Now we're telling adults, if you feel afraid, if you feel uncomfortable, that's a great word now, uncomfortable going to work, you have the right to stay home and work from home. If you feel uncomfortable going to school, you don't have to go back. If you feel uncomfortable with um, your kids playing with one another in the park, you don't have to have your child go play in the park. It's, it's all about your comfort. No, it's actually not about your comfort. It's about what's right and wrong and true and false. That's never been contested before in the United States. And now suddenly uh, that idea is considered heretical. It's considered worthy of censorship, banning, and shaming. That has to stop. If that doesn't stop, we're, we're just done. Yeah, I mean, we cannot run the world based on everybody's fears. Uh, the germophobia has skyrocketed. And, and, you know, we raised our kids, my wife and I, Lisa and I, uh, they're now 31, 29, and 27. Uh, and, you know, we raised them to trust their bodies, that you have this innate intelligence, that you have an immune system. And there's a truth to understanding how the body works. And that, you know, a lot of people don't know, they're afraid of germs, and they don't really know that right now in every single person that's watching this, if you're watching this, don't freak out based on what I'm about to tell you, but you have trillions of bacteria and trillions of viruses in you and on you all the time. And it's about the balance of those things, which is what your immune system and your nervous system and your nutrition and all of that help maintain in your stress levels, help maintain the balance of those things to keep you healthy. And those are under control based on your choices. But if you live in fear and your body is organizing and your mind is organizing itself around fear, I, you've quoted me and probably a hundred other people like me when you say it's not just about your feelings, but you have to do it anyway and you have to commit to it anyway. And we have to get over the point where we run our lives based on our feelings. Uh, I have often say to the, the people that we work with, did you ever have something that 10 years ago you felt a certain way about it? And now 10 years later, you feel differently about it? And people will always say yes. And so if, if your feelings are going to change, then you need to run your life, not just based on how you feel in the moment, but based on these truths, based on your commitments. And, you know, here we have kids that are not going to school. They are in school behind these plastic barriers that are scary as if those things, as if the boogers that are out there are not flying over and around and through and as if they're actually doing something. So what would you, if you were going to run the show, the country, the schools, what would you, based on your medical experience, your understanding of science, what would you tell governments, teachers, administrators to do? Well, I've said from the beginning that the biggest mistake that we've made in this country throughout this pandemic, both the fear pandemic and the viral pandemic, was closing schools. The schools should never have been closed, ever. Schools have been open in most countries around the world since the beginning, March, April, 2020. And there has been 
essentially no health problem whatsoever in any of these schools. And in fact, in Germany, it was reported in May, as early as May of last year, that children who were in school were healthier than the children that were at home under all conditions, all medical conditions, and the teachers were healthier at school than they were at home, less likely to get sick for any cause and far less likely to get sick with this Chinese Wuhan flu. So the evidence that children and teachers are in any way unsafe at school is utterly absent. It just doesn't exist. I would tell Americans and educators that they need to reopen all of the schools from preschool up through graduate school university now. And there should be no restrictions whatsoever placed on the students. No social isolation, no masks, no plexiglass shields, no um, excessive hand washing. And I say excessive because I know a, a, a pupil here in Santa Monica that went back to school two weeks ago. <laughs> I'm laughing because it's, it's, it's so ridiculous. Only 12 students were allowed in the class versus the regular 24. Each student was sitting uh, in front of a table with a computer, wearing headphones, plexiglass glass shields around him. And there were monitors roaming through the classroom to tell the children that they couldn't take their headphones off, get up or go to the bathroom unless someone accompanied them, but they couldn't go with anyone else, meaning other children. And the teacher was quote unquote teaching from her home into the computer where the kids were sitting in the classroom. So they were at Zoom school at school. And this poor boy left that day and the days following telling his mother, I feel like I'm in prison. Yeah. This is scaring me. And his hands were cracked and bleeding because he was forced to wash his hands with ethyl alcohol sanitizer every hour for eight hours a day. He was getting infections through his skin because the best barrier to infection, which is our skin, was broken due to the cracking and the dermatologic condition that was coming on in his body because of the ethyl alcohol and all the overwashed hand washing. So that's nonsense. It's not only uh, not helpful, it's actually damaging. I would tell all people who say, well, wearing masks, washing hands, distancing, it, it's not going to hurt anything. I mean, if it just saves one life, why not have kids go back to school with all of these restrictions? Well, that's foolish. We don't run health policy based on that. That's the Bill de Blasio style of governing. If we only saved one life, we can do the following. I could save 50,000 lives tomorrow if I were, as you said, anointed uh, king of the kingdom by telling everyone that automobiles are banned. 50,000 lives saved in one year. Just ban the car. We don't do that. Children should be back at school because they're not getting sick, they're not dying, and they're not infecting adults. Masks are harmful in multiple ways to children. They are actually increasing anxiety and depression, as well as various medical illnesses in the mouth and the skin and the lungs. They are limiting development in children. Uh, the distancing back at school is causing a whole host of anxiety and depressive problems. Substance abuse, suicidal ideation, death is going up because of these restrictions. And the teachers themselves are mostly in their 40s. They're mostly healthy. They have absolutely no risk for this illness. And children has found in the German mass study back in, in June, July, that kids in school without masks actually protected the teachers from infection compared to the teachers staying at home with their families and teaching remotely. So summary of all of this is there's no evidence that children are in any way worse off at school. In fact, the evidence shows the opposite. Same with teachers. And if we were to return everybody to school tomorrow, we would probably increase the health and well-being of our country more than any other decision, any other single decision we made. And it's already been done around the world. There's never been any problems. America is, is a laughing stock of the world for keeping their children at home. It's abusive, it's irrational, it's harmful, and it's completely, completely and totally unscientific. The only reason why we're still doing it, in my view, is that parents and adults are anxious and scared, and they're using the children as a way to palliate their own anxiety, rather than, as I said earlier, feeling scared and anxious, acting in spite of it, and doing the right thing, which is what we as adults and parents have been tasked with doing from the beginning of time, taking care of our children, making them the priority, 
and not trying to use the children to treat our own fears. That is wrong. Yes, and uh, well said, and and so important that you're willing to talk about these things. We have a lot to talk about still. You're bringing up a lot of things. You know, we put an article on 100 Year Lifestyle. It's called Eliminating Waste from Your Body. And there are four ways your body eliminates waste. And that is sweat, urine, feces, and expiration. So we are literally taking, you talked about the problems that are happening from people inhaling uh, their own expiration. And it's, it's becoming really severe. And there was a study done, the CDC published it, and then I think they suppressed it and they put it down that the majority of people that were testing positive, 85% of them were always or often wearing a mask. Whereas the people that did not test positive, only 8% of them that did not test positive in this group, they never wore a mask. What you're saying is true that we have it backwards, but here's what's happening out in the world. We're, we're being taught that, no, you have to wear this mask. Otherwise you are going to infect other people. We're learning that's all wrong. And then we're saying, okay, let's mass vaccinate everybody with this untested vaccine. I want to get your input on this because, listen, I don't wear masks and we raised our kids with natural healthy immune systems. They were not vaccinated. They were naturally immune, immunized. And now we're saying we're going to take this vaccine and we're going to give it to everybody or you can't go to a concert. You can't go to a ball game. You can't go to a, uh, to work. You can't get on an airplane unless you're vaccinated. You can't go into the grocery store unless you're vaccinated. What's going on? Well, I want to say, first of all, so that people don't dismiss me as a quote unquote anti-vaxxer, that I am not opposed to vaccines in principle. And I received all of my vaccines growing up. My mother was a nurse. I've never had any problems personally with vaccination. Although having looked at this experimental vaccine process, I've started to notice that there's a lot of data and a lot of um, absent information regarding pre-existing vaccines that I'm now becoming aware of. However, um, I am not in principle opposed to vaccines. So anybody that hears me say the following can't dismiss me as an anti-vaxxer because that's not, I'm not in that camp. But I am firmly opposed to this experimental vaccine for the Chinese Wuhan flu for several reasons. The most notable is <laughs> that 99% of the population doesn't need it. We never mass vaccinate a population for a disease that is non-lethal. And I say non-lethal in 99% of the population. It makes no sense. So that's the first problem I have with it, regardless of the product itself. Now, looking at the product, this experimental vaccine is using in this country with Moderna and Pfizer for the first time, a technology that has never been used in humans, which is mRNA technology. Technically speaking, the product is not a vaccine. It's actually a therapeutic agent and it does not confer immunity in the way that typical immune challenge shots do. It doesn't challenge your immune system. It actually orders your immune system to start to produce antibodies to the coronavirus uh, proteins in the body that normally your body would recognize if you just got infected and produce on their own. But because it's doing it in a coded way through a special process that goes into your, uh, your cells, it has a lot more risk of causing long-term unexpected modifications in the way your immune system functions. It doesn't allow for natural immune system uh, activation in the way that, that traditional vaccines do. It doesn't yell at your immune system and say, hey, start fighting off this infection before it comes in. It actually goes in and reprograms your immune system. I have a problem with that because it's never been tested before in humans and this product was only, only tested for eight weeks in Americans. Eight weeks. It was never tested in animals. And even the study's authors wrote in their conclusion papers for both the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines that the vaccine increases the risk of loss of pregnancy, which is why pregnant women were excluded from all of the trials. It increases the risk of autoimmune disorders, particularly in women, in later stages, like not in a week or a month, but 5, 10, 15 years later, they have no way of knowing how severe because it's only been tested for eight weeks. And it runs the risk of people who, all, who already have hyperactive immune systems who have already been exposed to the live virus to suffer from 
uh, what's called antibody enhancement syndrome, which means that if you already have antibodies to this Chinese Wuhan flu and you get these shots, your body could go into hyperdrive and overdrive and start to create all kinds of problems for you, like anaphylactic shock, uh, thromboses or blood clots, a heart attack, stroke, respiratory shutdown. This was written in the papers when it was submitted, and the CDC and all of the proponents of this experimental vaccine have poo-pooed this away and said that it's not relevant to the extent that the CDC switched its guidelines within weeks of these shots becoming available from saying pregnant women should not get it to pregnant women should not only get it, they shouldn't even talk to their doctors about it. And since then, we've had over 18,000 adverse events reported in the Vaccine Adverse Events Reporting System, or VAERS, in the U.S., and over 1,500 deaths reported following these vaccinations, half of which were removed by the CDC two weeks ago after they just arbitrarily decided that, well, those deaths don't count. They don't have anything to do with the shots. They didn't explain why. And generally speaking, only 1% of all of the adverse events and deaths are actually reported in the system. That's based on past history with, say, the flu shot. Even given that, even assuming that that, that's, that it's 100%, and it's certainly not even anywhere close, the current rate of adverse events and deaths for these shots is eight times greater than that of the previous flu shots that we get every year. Eight times greater. That's per person. I'm not talking about the total. I mean, per capita, per shot given, the rate is eight times higher. That doesn't sound safe to me. And the fact that a lot of the deaths are being ignored, they're being censored, and the CDC has yet to admit that even a single death is attributable to these shots makes me incredibly suspicious that there is a campaign launched against truthful information about safety and efficacy of the injections. And if you can't get good information, if as a consumer, as a patient, you're not told the truth, the actual facts about what the risks are versus what the benefits are, how do you make an informed decision? So people in this country can't make informed decisions. And if you can't make an informed decision, my position is you should stay away from it, at least until we know within six months, nine months or a year, more real data about who needs it, who doesn't, who benefits, who doesn't benefit, and who actually is at greatest risk of harm. That's my position on these shots. And I'm certainly open to changing it over time. But as of now, no one has given me enough evidence to convince me that the benefits outweigh the risks. And, and to clarify my position, I mean, listen, there's, there's no liability for anybody like, hey, we're going to mandate this and then we're going to abandon you and we're going to mandate this, but we're not responsible. We're going to make so if you die or if you're somebody gets sick, we're not responsible. And like you say, the data is not in yet. So it's not even a matter of vax or anti-vax. If there is a risk, there should be a choice. And I think that's where healthcare freedom really is all about. And when you see these mandates coming through, if they said to you, if you're going to have to, for you to go to work, Dr. McDonald, you're going to have to have this vaccine or we're going to take your job away from you. We're going to take your work away from you or we're going to fire you. I know you have a, a clinic that you have at your own clinic and you can make the rules in your clinic at least. What do you say about that? Well, you've brought up an, a very important additional point. Many Americans may not be aware of the fact that this experimental vaccine is experimental. I'm not just using that as an opinion. It's a fact. It's legally, factually true that this is an experimental vaccine authorized under what's called the Emergency Use Authorization, EUA, in the federal government. Only products that are being used to treat a medical condition for which there is no accepted or established alternative treatment are granted an EUA, which allows you to jump the queue and skip all of the safety and efficacy testing as well as animal testing. It's considered an emergency, meaning if we don't get this out, millions of people will die. So it's worth trying because even if we have a certain loss ratio of a few thousand or 100,000 people in the net, we're saving a lot of lives. You know, let's say Ebola broke out in the US and we were losing a million people a day. And we found that there was a shot that would save 95% of the people and maybe it would kill 5% just from the shot. We'd still do it and I would support it. I wouldn't make it mandatory, but I'd say, look, you've got a 5% risk of dying from this shot, but you've got about an 80% risk of getting infected with Ebola. And if you do, you have a 95% chance of dying from that. 
make up your mind. Well, you know what? I would take it. I, I'm, I'm a rational person. Your immune system can't fight Ebola, at least not yet. Most people. But that's not what we have here. We have a disease that has a 99.98% survival rate. And if you're under 70, it's over 99.99%. Over and if you're healthy, it's 99.997%. It's basically like a flu for most people. And yet we're given an emergency drug that does not have FDA approval for use outside of an experimental setting. In other words, we are all consenting and you have to consent to this. You cannot be forced to get this shot under EUA, EAU rather. You have to consent to being a subject in a massive national experiment for which the FDA has not granted approval of a product. And for that reason, currently it is illegal under federal law to mandate an experimental medical device or medical product. It is illegal. So if there were any employers or government agencies, or private or public, who told an employee, you cannot work without this shot, you would be in your right to file a lawsuit and win. And it's already been filed in New York. Uh, a waitress was fired there a few weeks ago for refusing to take this shot, even though she agreed to wear gloves, face masks, distancing, all that other nonsense. But the employer fired her because she wouldn't get the shot. And she had just got married. She was in her late 20s and she wanted to get pregnant. And she said very calmly and rationally, I'm not an anti-vaxxer, but I wanna get pregnant. Women, pregnant women were not studied in this trial. I know that increased loss of miscarriage of child is, is a factor in taking this shot. And so far, 25 women in the US have lost their babies in the second trimester after getting this injection, which is very rare. Most pregnancies are lost in the first trimester due to mutations. It's called natural abortion. It's the body's way of expelling uh, a fetus that is not viable. But in second trimester, that's not, the, that's not what happens. Uh, babies don't get lost in the second trimester unless the mother is ill for some reason. So 25 babies lost in a few weeks just from these people that got shots is, is, is kind of concerning. And she said, no, I'm not getting it. She was fired. She's filed a lawsuit. Anyone else has that right as well. Because as of now, unless uh, the federal government changes the law, and I don't know how they could without getting an enormous backlash, you cannot legally be mandated to take this experimental vaccine as a condition of employment, period. Well, what's interesting is, is that you talked about that it's illegal to mandate it corporately where you say, you know, you have to, but they're making people feel like they're immoral if they don't. So, right. you know, this illegal versus immoral. And you know, I, I think it's important to, for everybody listening to know is that that's not true. You are not immoral if you are informed and you make a choice, that you are entitled to make a choice. This is still the United States of America. This is not the communist states of America. This is not the socialist states of America. This is still the United States of America. And healthcare freedom has always been something that is a part of our DNA in this country. And, you know, it's interesting. I have studied the history of informed consent going back to World War II and the experimental shots that were given to uh, the Jews and to the other people that lined up in these camps. And, you know, it's really scary. And the, the laws and the principle of informed consent was born out of the Holocaust. And what I find really interesting when you look at it, the doctors that were, they said an order is an order. I was just following orders. I did what I was told to do. And the doctors did not use judgment. They just followed those orders and they ended up going to prison and some of them were put to death. And what was interesting, Dr. Mark, is the case. A lot of people don't know this, but the cases that were filed were the United States of America versus those doctors. So the United States of America actually brought those doctors, those Nazi doctors to justice and carried out their sentences. And now here we have a situation where the United States of America is violating its own principles of informed consent in many ways and looking to mandate either legally or socially that people line up and make these choices, otherwise they're un-American, otherwise they're a danger to society. So with that, as we start to wind down, and I must say, I, I so appreciate your candor. You are a strong voice. You are an example of courage, my friend, because I know that there's a lot on the line that people like you, people like me, that and everybody watching and that's going to share this, please share this with everybody. You know, this is a valuable, valuable interview here that Dr. McDonald has generously uh, given us his time for. So with those principles of informed consent and 
choice that you and I talked about. How would you bring this together, wind this down, wrap it up uh, as, uh, as we move forward and hopefully make a massive impact with this conversation? Well, I think that every person, every individual has to ultimately make his or her choice, as I did back in April. You cannot live safely and live fully at the same time. You cannot worship at the altar of safety and expect to lead uh, a life that allows you to fulfill your potential. You have to acknowledge the reality that life comes with risk. That's unavoidable and it's inevitable. Once you accept that, then you have to make a decision if you're willing to stand up for that principle or not. I decided that I couldn't continue to manage my practice, to maintain my integrity and to sleep at night without standing up for that principle. I was never afraid. I didn't have the fear uh, handicap. Uh, I'm not a fearful person. So that was certainly to my advantage, but I had a lot to lose. And I decided in spite of that, that if I were to stay silent, to not speak up, to not act uh, in accordance with my values and beliefs, in order to protect my material possessions, my practice, my local reputation as a physician, that it wouldn't matter in the end because all that would be gone anyway. The idea that one can just remain silent as the boxcars come for the neighbor because he happens to be gay, he happens to be a gypsy, he happens to be black, he happens to be uh, mentally ill, and that the boxcars are not going to come for you eventually. And the fact that once they do, you're going to look right and look left and realize there's going to be really no one there to help you, then you're a fool. And we learned that from the 20th century from Nazi Germany. So you need to make a decision. And I say you, every individual American has to make a decision. This doesn't come from government. Government's not going to find the solution and answer for you. You are the answer and the solution. And you need to make a choice. Are you going to think for yourself? Or are you going to continue to allow others to think for you who will not be thinking of you? That's from Thoreau. He wrote that 200 years ago. I believe that it, it rings as true today as it did when he wrote it. Americans need to take back their own mind and their own brain. And I am not asking or, or encouraging anyone who listens to this to agree with me. I do not care if you agree with me. If you disagree with me, challenge me. I like disagreement. What I am demanding of everyone is to start thinking for him and herself. The reason why we're in this pickle is because people stopped doing it. They became compliant and dependent. And don't give me this nonsense that you're afraid, that you want to be safe, that you want to be comfortable. That's a code word for I'm being compliant. Well, compliance is what led to the Holocaust. That's where we're headed now. Make no, no mincing of words about it. This is where we are heading. We have to reject this foolish, uh, self-sacrificial, suicidal bent towards compliance and acceptance that other people know better than we do. That's the first step. That's what everyone has to do. And if you don't do it, I really honestly have no sympathy for you. I'm running out of sympathy for people who will not take that responsibility. That is your responsibility to yourself and to your, your, your country. It's a civic responsibility. And shame on you if you don't want to accept it. You don't deserve to be here. Yeah. And stand up to the people that want to shame you. I mean, listen, the reality of it is I was, a, I was in a grocery store. It was a, uh, right around the corner. And I was buying some vegetables and there was a woman standing in front of me. She was about probably 80 pounds overweight. I'm not judging anybody. I, I have no judgment. I am a live and let live. You make your choices. I'm going to make mine. You don't mandate your choices on me and my family. And I won't mandate my choices on you or your family. Just don't do anything to you know, hurt me, you know, specifically. And, you know, anyway, this woman, she had 12 bottles of Coke, Coca-Cola all different sizes. She had cookies. She had all kinds of desserts. It was filled with sugar and everything bad for you and processed foods, 80 pounds overweight. And she was married wearing a mask. And she looked at me not wearing a mask. And she tried to shame me because I was being unsafe and unhealthy and disrespectful. And I kindly said to her, I said, let me see your smile. <laughs> and I don't accept your shaming. I reject your shaming. And I care about you. I love you, but I reject your shame. I will not allow you to shame me. That is unacceptable. And I think that's a part of the courage, too, that you talked about. I think that it's time for all of us to be courageous, stand up for truth, 
and take this country back, not fear-based, but based on truth. And I love that in your industry with what you do in your profession, that you and I can have this conversation without censoring each other. And we don't have to agree on 100% of everything. But man, we are on the same page about 95 to 98% of everything. And I got to tell you, I'm honored that you would spend this time with me. I'm proud of the work that you're doing. You're a courageous man. And I hope that this conversation just imparts courage, this type of courage, even if it's just a smidgen of courage, but like the Wizard of Oz, courage, that everybody leaves this conversation with tremendous courage. Dr. Dr. Mark, how can people reach you? I post a lot of what I just spoke about in terms of articles, uh, reports, uh, recordings with, with raw information and data from sources that I trust on my Facebook page regularly. I just posted another couple in the last 24 hours, uh, including the uh, uh, rise of, we're going to let go of all of the restrictions, but you still have to wear a mask nonsense, which is happening in even great states like uh, Texas and Florida. Absolutely it's nuts. nuts. Uh, Daniel Horowitz published an amazing, very well-written piece yesterday, uh, which I uh, re, uh, reposted on my on my Facebook page. I think it's uh, from the Daily Beast. Um, and it's on uh, my open clinical Facebook page, which is easily found by searching for me under Mark McDonald, MD, all one word, Mark McDonald, MD, and you'll find it and you'll be able to look at the sources for which I attribute this. Uh, and you can also comment. And uh, if you have a question, I generally will respond to questions about those articles. I find that uh, that's the way for me to uh, maintain the best communication with people who are interested in what I have to say. I, I used to have a Parler account. Parler's gone. I still have a Twitter account, but most of what I put up there winds up being taken down. About 30% of what I put on Facebook is removed. Uh, but there's still enough there that uh, you can get some, some good information, in my opinion, from the page. And we're going to be relentless. Little censorship will not stop us. It'll just make us mad. <laughs> hey, listen, follow us also, 100yearlifestyle.com. Follow Dr. Mark. He's got great information, great guy, dedicated, big heart, a strong spirit. Uh, we're coming out with a free ebook, everybody. It's going to be be on the lookout. It's going to be becoming a least vulnerable person. What are the things that make you a more vulnerable person? What are the things that can make you a least vulnerable person? They are under your control. You have all kinds of choices. We are on your side. Dr. Mark, thanks again for everything. I'm, I'm sure that our paths will cross again. Everybody, thanks for watching. Remember, do all these things. Your 100 is coming. You make the call. Thank you so much for joining us on the 100 Year Lifestyle Podcast. We hope you enjoyed this episode. If you have topics that you want us to cover, people you want us to interview, maybe you have some stories that you want to share, stories of yourself, loved ones, people in your life, we would love to hear from you and share your story. Please email us at my100 at 100yearlifestyle.com. And remember, nobody wants to get to 100 or even 50, 60, or 70 for that matter, crippled, broke, and alone. So please share the 100 Year Lifestyle, all of our podcasts, social media pages, website with your family, friends, and coworkers so they can take this journey with you. And until next time, adjust your lifestyle. Live your best life today and every day on the road to a sensational century. Dr. Plasker, signing off.